up to you so I can be close to you. It's really simple if you look at it that way. Hello, brothers and sisters. Uh, today we are uh, recording testimony of uh, our brother uh, Elkan. Uh, he uh, he just he came from. Uh, uh, Islam to uh, to the light of Jesus Christ and we have now uh, our brother why not uh, tell us your testimony please go ahead thank you very much brother and good evening brothers and sisters um, this is my humble testimony um, coming from a cultural Islamic background um, my father was from North Cyprus uh, and my mother being from Scotland. So I am of mixed heritage. So I had not necessarily an, a religious upbringing. Religion wasn't a big thing in my house. So, you know, the understanding from both Christians and Muslims was I came from an unbelieving house though religion and God was not shunned it just wasn't spoken of now I was born on the 22nd of May 1976 I'm 45 years old but even from my earliest days that I can remember from the ages of around six years old I used to ask my father stories that i heard from the bible for example the miracle stories of moses and the prophets as any young boy would understand growing up in england superheroes were our gods i loved watching he-man and i loved watching you know transformers you know x-men all these superheroes with magical powers. This is the only thing that I can equate to with how miracles were, as recorded in the Bible, especially Moses, which I knew for some reason that Islam believed in. So I used to ask my father, as a small boy, tell me stories about Moses. You know, to me, he was the superhero. So, to the best of my father's ability, remembering that he wasn't a practicing Muslim, he was a cultural Muslim. So he used to explain to the best of his knowledge, the stories. I delve further and used to ask him other questions which he had no knowledge of. I used to remember where I grew up as a boy, there was a Pakistani mosque. There was two mosques where I grew up. One was Turkish, one was Pakistani. But I also had friends who I went to school with, and they were Pakistani Muslim. And we used to play and we used to visit each other in their houses. And so as I used to ask my father about deeper questions concerning Moses and the other prophets, that I came to know of, he couldn't answer. But he did recommend that I ask my friend's father, because he knew them, and he knew that they used to go to the mosque, the Pakistani mosque. So one evening, I was invited by my friends, you know, to play, and their father invited me for dinner. And so I asked their father. And so he said to me, Oh, you are interested about learning about God? And I said, yes. And I tell him, I ask my father about Moses and the prophets and the miracles. These are the superhero stories that, in my head that I want to know about. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he then invites me, if you want to learn about God, you must come to the mosque. And in that moment, my eyes lit up and my heart jumped. And I thought to myself, I can learn about God, the God of these superhero stories that I read about Moses and the prophets. 
So obviously, you know, as a six-year-old boy, I gladly accept. I start to attend the mosque. Now, I spoke English. My Turkish language had died away. You know, I couldn't speak Turkish anymore. So I had to learn Arabic. So uh, I learned the brother, alphabet. Uh, I have to stop you near a little bit. Because you spoke about uh, Turkish, you spoke about uh, Cyprus. Yes. Uh, please clarify which mm. side of uh, Cyprus you were from. Ah, oh, yes. That's okay, yes. Um, the history of Cyprus is from the time when my dad was born. Cyprus was one island. Greeks and Turks lived together. They were Cypriot. But in 1974, there was some political and religious turmoil within the island. And so Turkey sent in her army. And now what you understand with Cyprus is now it's divided. So you have the north yes. side, which is Turkish, and the, and the south side, which is Greek. So my father... By this time, my father had moved to Britain, but his family, his mother, and, well, his mother was still living in Cyprus. So she was living in the north side, so on the Muslim side. And the south side, which is Greek, was the Christian side. Yes. So with regard to when people hear me say that, you know, I'm Turkish, they automatically assume from Turkey. But I say, no, my father was from... And I, I do have to clarify to people from North Cyprus, you yes. know, because Cyprus in Europe is generally known as the Greek side, which is the Orthodox Christian side. But the North side for many years was not recognized by the European, most of the European countries. So when I speak about Cyprus regarding my father, then it would be the north side. Um, this happened in 1974, when the UN came in and divided the land to keep the peace. It's still there today, it's called the Green Line. And there's a section in, like Germany was, you know, after yes, the Second yes. World War. This is Cyprus today. So the north side is Cypriot Turkish, So they would be majority Muslim, and the south side is Greek, which would be majority Christian. So this is where my father grew up. Yes. This is where my father was born, and he grew up. Yeah. He came to England after the Second World War. But again, he's Turkish by culture, so he would have been brought up, you know, with yes. the knowledge of Islam. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, this would be, you know. So back to your understanding uh, of yeah, you were speaking yeah. about uh, you forgot uh, your uh, Turkish at the time, and uh, when you went to the yeah. mosque, uh, it was a Pakistani mosque or a Turkish mosque. It was a Pakistani mosque. All right. <laughs> so when I grew up in London, there were I grew up in an area of London that had, you know. There was a big community of Turkish people, obviously Muslim, also a big community of Jewish people and a big community of Pakistani Muslims or, yeah, you know. So in my area where I grew up, there were two mosques. One was Pakistani and one was Turkish. So the imams in one mosque were Pakistani and in the mosque in the other one were Turkish. But I and my friends, you know, my friends were, you know, they went to the Pakistani mosque. So that's where I went. I assumed they were Sunni, you know, um, but yeah. So, you know, I started to attend, you know, and yes. I was given, I remember it to this day, I was given this small little green booklet with the Arabic alphabet. And so I learned the Arabic alphabet and the pronunciations, you know. So 
you know, I started to go and I started to learn Arabic and read Arabic texts, you know. And all the time that I used to attend, I think this was, yeah, it was every day after school between the hours of five and six o'clock. And Fridays would be five to seven o'clock, obviously, for the prayers, you know. Um, so I used to go every day, be picked up in the in the bus, you know, where all the children used to go and we used to go and read and learn and pray, things like that. But all the time in my head, you know, I wasn't explained anything about what I was reading or I wasn't taught anything about, you know, the good of Islam. Perhaps this may have been a grace of God because in my head, I was praying to the God of Moses, you know. Yes. This happened for, you know, many, many, many years, you know, up until the age of, actually, when I was 10, a new, not a rule, but a new lesson came into the mosque where we were being taught the language of Urdu. So we had a strict teacher and in our lessons, if we made a mistake, then we would get five lashes on the hand for each mistake that we made in our language lesson, not Arabic, not Quranic lesson, but language lesson. So one evening, um, Hold on, brother. That's in UK. Yeah. That's in UK. You are being uh, beaten. Yes, it's in the UK. Yes. And and they weren't being reported. No. Okay. No. Please keep going. I will do. You know. So <coughs> I remember specifically the last day that I attended this Pakistani mosque. This is after four years was again we were we were being taught the language of urdu you know which is an arabic so i made nine mistakes in my exam if you want to call it that yes. you know our teacher used to ask us questions or ask us to read something and if we made a mistake he would strike us on the hand five times but all this wasn't done immediately he would count up how many mistakes were made and then he would total them up and then he would receive the beating on the hand. So I made my mistakes in one lesson. So that is equal to 45 lashes with the cane on my hands. By this time, my sister started to attend um, the mosque with me. But we were in separate classrooms. So after this beating, I ran and found my sister and I showed her my hands. I was crying. The tears were rolling. My nose was running everywhere. My hands were burning. Oh my God. And so my sister took me home and she said to my father, look what they've done to your son's hands. Was she older than you? Yes, my sister is five years older than me. Oh. Yeah. So she was able to explain. I wasn't, you know, I was destroyed. You, I couldn't even. You were speak. in tears. Oh, yeah. Tears. Everything was running. Any hole in my head was running with nose, eyes, ears. My hands were red, you know, like a strawberry. Um, Upon seeing my my hands, my father's face also went red and he took me back to the mosque and he asked me to point out the teacher that did this to me and I pointed him out and, you know, apart from violence, my father wasn't a violent man, but he said, I send my son to your mosque to learn to pray to God. Why is he coming home with red hands? And the teacher couldn't give an answer. 
you know, um, my again, my father didn't report it, but my father said he's not coming again to this mosque ever. This is where the second mosque comes in, the Turkish one. Yeah, can I cut where, you in here a little bit, and then you continue? This is where yes, this is where uh, Muslims they will tell you, Alhamdulillah, ala ni'mat al-Islam. Thanks, thanks Allah for the b- blessing of Islam, for the ni'mat al-Islam. Uh, and that's not na'ma at all. That's not a blessing. Islam never been na'ma at all. Never been a blessing. Please go, keep going. Keep no. Going. No. The fact even that I wasn't even learning, you know, Islam. I was, le- I was learning another language. Urdu, yes. So, uh, yeah, this doesn't even make sense. No. You know, um, so my father takes me out and he says, if you want, there's the Turkish mosque, you know. Yes. Again, in the area where I grew up. So we went there, you know, the following evening, and my father questioned and talked about physical discipline. And the answer was given was, you know, for misbehavior, you know, of course, you know, if a child is rude and being disrespectful, then they will be given physical punishment. But when it comes to making mistakes, you know, reading the Quran wrong or, you know, no, you know, we don't do this. You know, this is not right for the child to be beaten. This was the the Turkish interpretation of, you know. Yes. It was more lenient, I would say, you know. So, you know, I continued there for a while, but my experience with what happened to me in the Pakistani mosque, you know, my heart just kind of fell away, you know. So when I was 12, uh, my father passed away. So because of this, yeah, um, I stopped attending, you know. Um, Personal things happened in my life. You know, my father, knowing he was going to die, asked my brother-in-law, who wasn't Muslim, he was a um, an ex-Roman Catholic, but he asked him to come and look after me and my mom and my sister after my father had passed away. Yes. But as a boy, you know, um, losing my father, you know, um, again, I didn't, still remembering that I don't know who God is, you know, I haven't been told who he is. I've only learned Arabic, you know, but in my head, I'm thinking, you know, I'm doing something for the creator. You know, I know there's something above us. You know, this sense in all human beings that there has to be something else. Nothing comes just on its own. There has to be a creator somewhere. You know, so given this concept in my head of who God is, you know, I never doubted that, okay, I've gone through bad experiences in the mosque and my father dying, but I always believed that there was this creator outside of creation. You know, this always has been with me, again, since I was a a small boy. You know, I don't know where it came from. It's the earliest memory that I can remember. Yes. You know. So from the ages of 12 till, you know, my teenage years, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, you know, I lived at home with um, my mum, my sister, my other sister's family and her husband. Now, you know, he wasn't a good man either. He was a violent man. And, you know, he ruled the house with an iron fist. You know, there was violence, there was emotional abuse, there was, you know, physical abuse. You know, it wasn't a good time for me, you know, or my sister, or anyone who lived under him, you know, my brother-in-law. But, um, you know, during this time, um, my sister, I have two sisters, one sister from my mum and my dad and a half sister. So my full sister, 
during this time had become a Jehovah's Witness. Okay. So she'd already left the house by then. She was kicked out by my brother-in-law. Again, you know, he was like a Hitler. He was like Mohammed. <laughs> <laughs> so she was on the streets for a time, you know, until, you know, she found a charity for homeless teenagers that was run by a Christian church. Yes. But during this time, she was still a Jehovah's Witness. And she used to come to my secondary school, my high school, and talk to me about, you know, Jehovah and, you know, the Jehovah's Witness theology. But I never used to listen to her. You know, it didn't mean anything to me. You know, I was a 15, 16 year old boy. Yes. By the grace of God, she was saved and she became a Christian. And one year when I was 18, she invited me to a Christian youth camp in England. And, you know, to me, it didn't mean anything, but I thought, you know, it's a holiday. So why not? So I decided to go, you know, get out of London for a couple of weeks, you know, meet new people. You know, to me, it didn't matter that it was Christian. You know, it was just like, I've been invited to holiday. I want to have a good time. So I went, you know, um, my sister invited me and I went. And it was during this two week youth camp at a Christian um, retreat that, you know, I became Christian. Hallelujah. You know, how, since then, how did you, yeah. how did you agree? Uh, first, how did you think, uh, hmm. get that, uh, let's say Muhammad is fake. Allah is not a real Allah, a real God. And how did you, uh, accept Jesus? How I know you were young, but how did yeah. it come to you that Jesus is a, a real God? <laughs> The thing is, um, I saw God as my father, as in my human father. Yes. Now, I loved my father. He loved me and he cared for me and he provided for me. So my idea of God, if anything, is going to be one like how I saw my relationship with my earthly father. So when it came to Muhammad and Allah of the Quran, again, you know, I wasn't taught anything about Islam. I was only taught Arabic, you know. Yes. I wasn't encouraged to read Hadith or to find translation. It was read this, pray like this, you know, say Shahada. I didn't, I don't actually think I said Shahada, to be honest, but in my head, you know, Yes, they took you the for boys, granted that you are a Muslim yeah, from your you know, father. You know, obviously, I mean, yeah, so the boys and girls, you know, who were brought up Islamic, you know, they would talk about Muhammad and Allah, you know, Muhammad is his prophet, you know. And so, but again, I didn't know who this Muhammad was, you know. I didn't know who Allah was. He was the God that I saw my father to be. Yes. So... You know, the fear of Allah, as the Quran explains, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't know about it. You know, my relationship to, to God in, in my head was like me and my father on earth. He yes. loved me. He cared for me. You know, I loved him. You know, so yes. when I remember this one, this one specific um, incident in the mosque, and there was this other um, Turkish girl and she said to me do you fear Allah now in my head I'm thinking well do I fear and to me that meant am I scared and I thought to myself well I'm not scared of my dad why should I be scared of Allah exactly you know and so yeah. I said why should I be scared of Allah he loves me yeah, I'm thinking exactly this is an innocent know, yeah. reaction exactly you're yeah. right yes yeah you know so I think to myself actually no I don't fear Allah 
why should I? He loves me. Why should I fear someone who loves me? I don't fear my dad. Why should I fear God? If he's my creator, why should I fear him? Surely it's better to love him than to fear him. You know, and this Turkish girl said to me, oh, you have to fear Allah or you will go to hell. You know, to me, yes. this made no sense. It made no logic. Yes. So, you know. So what did you see in the camp uh, that made you feel like uh, Jesus or uh, the God of the Bible is right to accept it? You know, it's a bit of a strange story, but, you know, from the moment I got there, you know, there was people, from, you know, all over England and some people from Europe, you know, who come yearly to this youth camp. It's still going on today. You know, they have, um, it's a Christian mission, well, not a missionary site, but anyway, that's for another story, another time. But, you know, there was no judgment. There was no, you know, condemnation. You know, it was just young people hanging out together, meeting in the evening for the sermon and worship, you know, and... You know, just Christian brothers and sisters accepting me and treating me as a human being. You know, they didn't treat me any different as they would anybody else. You know, it yes. was irrelevant that I was Christian or not. It didn't matter, you know. And so the love and the freedom that I found within this, you know, Christian youth camp was a relief. You know, I could be free, you know, again, coming from my upbringing as a teenager in London, you know, this was a relief to me. It's like, wow, happiness can be found, <coughs> you know, um, not to say that, you know, the Christian life is built solely to be happy, but, you know, coming from a, a worldly perspective, you know, I really enjoyed it. So one evening, as I said before, there was a talk, there was worship, like a, a mini church service. So there was worship music where we all gather into the main tent and we all sing. And then the, the pastor would come and give a talk. And on this specific evening, um, the talk was on um, sexuality in the Christian worldview. Now, the pastor spoke a lot about sexual sin, considering, you know, um, young teenage and young adult Christians, you know. Yes. It's something that we have to cope with, you know, from, you know, fornication to everything regarding what is sexuality according to what God says rather than what the world says. You know, and teenagers are... You know, they are susceptible to falling into the trap of sexual sin. You know, so as any good Christian, you know, teacher would explain these things. So afterwards, I was a bit, you know, agitated in my, in, in my, in my soul about what this man was, what this pastor was saying. So I spoke to him afterwards and I said, Again, bearing in mind that my idea of God is how I saw my father. Yes. You know, and I automatically said, well, I, didn't auto I said to him, but surely, you know, God isn't angry with his children if he loves us. Then why should, you know, someone who commits a sexual sin like fornication or homosexuality, things like that, masturbation, whatever, why should God be angry with them? He loves his children. And so the man who gave the talk said to me, this is true, and God does love his children. But he is also loves what he has created. And he has created sex to be in the confines of marriage. And he gave me an example you know, of how 
and why sex outside of marriage is wrong. And he used it like this. He said to me, have you ever disobeyed your parents? And I said, yeah. And he said to me, and have they disciplined you? And I said, yeah, I remember, especially one time. And he said, well, God in a way is like that. God has said in the Bible how sex is to be. And so if his children step out of these boundaries, then God as a loving father must discipline his children. And then it clicked in my head. I'm like, ah, because in my head, I was thinking discipline is bad. Right. So if God disciplines then God must be bad. Yes. But then I think to myself, you know, my parents disciplined me when I was a boy growing up. But they did it because they loved me. And the pastor said, it's when God disciplines us when we sin. That's because God loves us. And then it clicked in my head that this all makes sense now. All the Old Testament laws, all the New Testament laws about this sexual sin. You know, it all made sense. And I'm like, I always used to think that, you know, God only loves who loves those who are perfect. And he said, you know, the Christian message is no one is perfect. Exactly. You know, and I thought in my head, well, this is true because I knew I wasn't perfect. Yes. If I was, then my parents wouldn't need to discipline me. You know, all my teachers, if I did something wrong at school, you know, there is discipline there. It's needed. A child needs to discipline. And so he said to me, and from, and from God, none of us are perfect, you know. And then he, he led me through the scriptures and he said, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then he said, but this is why Jesus Christ came. You know, going back a few years, yes, because I'd heard of Jesus Christ by this time. Um, after my father died, I was about 15 or 16. Now, by the grace of God, I don't know why, but there was always a Bible in our house. And as a teenager, I used to go and like snooping, <laughs> you know, and there was a wardrobe. Um, in a spare room in my mum's house. And on the top shelf, there was a Gideon's Bible. You know what a Gideon's Bible is? Yes. Yes. It's yes. New Testament and the Psalms. So I picked it up and it was like, oh, New Testament. So I, I sat down on the floor and I started to read the Gospels. I was looking for all the miracles as I did back as when I was a little boy asking my father about all the miracle stories of Moses. So when I start to open this New Testament, I start to read or go through all to find all the miracles of the Bible. Jesus healing the leper, Jesus healing the dead, Jesus healing the blind man. You know, all these superhero stories that I knew from when I was six years old, you know, but in my reading of the New Testament, the Gospels, I didn't go into the epistles or anything like that. I just wanted the superhero stories, <laughs> right? So I'm reading Matthew, right? So I find all the miracles in Matthew. Then I get to the end of Matthew and Jesus is tried, crucified, and he's risen again. Then I get to the Gospel of Mark and I do all the same with Luke and with John. And in my head, I didn't understand anything about how to read the Bible. I thought Matthew, Mark, Luke and John was one account. So at the end of coming to the end of John, again, Jesus is tried, he's crucified and he's risen. And in my head, I'm thinking chronologically, I'm like, Jesus dies four times and he's risen four times. Now, obviously, this is not the Christian testimony. No, this is how you felt. This is how you understood it. Yes. 
in my head I'm understanding there's something important about this death, burial and resurrection story that's being retold in each gospel. Yes. To me, it's happening four times, you know, in the life of Jesus, you know. Looking back, when I understand how I read as a 15-year-old boy, how I read the gospel accounts as one story, I realized that God was still speaking to me. Because even if I forget all the miracles, there's something about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Looking back with hindsight, you know, it makes sense to me now that God was speaking to me through my misinterpretation or my misunderstanding of how to read the scriptures. You know, um, coming back to the talk with the pastor, you know, I asked him about this, you know, but didn't Jesus die four times and raise four times? And he went, no, <laughs> there was only one Jesus. He only died once and he rose again once, you know. I said to him, it sounds like as a sinner, you know, I need his forgiveness. Because he spoke to me about, you know, being dead in sin, you know, and Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead, you know, heaven and hell, die without Christ, go to hell, die with Christ, you go to be with him in heaven. And upon realizing this, I said, well, I don't want to die and go to hell. You know, obviously from the Islamic perspective, there's also heaven and hell. But I didn't even know what heaven of Allah even meant. You know, it's, it's, it's not again, the it's, same. It's not even, Jannah is different. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So upon hearing, upon hearing this, you know, then I said, well, I don't want to die and go to hell. And I know I'm a sinner. So I said to him, you know, can I become Christian? And he said, of course you can. So he led me through the prayer. I didn't know what I was doing or what I was saying. You know, I just repeated what he said, you know, and afterwards, you know, he said, congratulations, you're a Christian now, you know. Amen. To me, I didn't know what that meant, but subsequently, you know, um, he led me back to my tent. Um, obviously, it's a campsite, so we all had tents to sleep in. So yes. he led me back to my tent because it's now maybe 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. And he spoke to the leader of the tent and he explained what had just happened. And, you know, we've just had a talk about Christ and sin and the talk of the evening about sexuality and sin and things like that. And said you know he's given his life to christ so you know welcome your brother so you know the next morning you know again nothing really miraculous changed in me but it was a gradual process you know yes. um came back to london and started attending the local anglican church and you know joined the worship group before before you go further but keep that in mind when you where you arrived yeah yes. uh yes. while you were speaking with a priest how it came mm. to your mind why, why you thought about you sinned against jesus why it came to your mind like that how you were young how you thought about sins again yes you know when i was six years old this was the the thought that was going through my head when he said when he explained to me what sin was and he said, have you ever disobeyed your mother and father? Yes. You know, this would go back to the fifth commandment, you know, and I said, yes, I have disobeyed them. And were you punished? And I said, of course I was punished. You know, I remember, and this is the point that I will bring up to you. And, you know, he said, this is what it's like with God. When we sin against God, then as a loving father, he must, he must discipline, he must punish. 
this is what a loving father does you know yes but jesus you know now the story that i want to elaborate how i equated my sin before god yes was when i was six years old um i heard the f word f-u-c-k yes, yes. right I, understand. I didn't know what it meant i didn't understand it you know to me it was just the word so in my head i did a little experiment don't try this at home children it's not a good idea but i thought to myself i don't know if this is a good word or a bad word so i will use this word to my mum or my dad now i came home from school and my mum asked me to do something and i said f off f u c k off yes yes you know and the look on her face was like the wrath of god she was so angry wow. and my father was my father was in the in the kitchen when i said it and when i saw the look on my mother's face i thought to myself aha this word is a bad word <laughs> you know because my i had disrespected my mother by saying this filthy word to her my father disciplined me yes he took out the pain he laid me over his lap and he gave me six wax over the the backside yes you know then i it hurt of course then i knew ouch okay don't swear to your mom ever again this word is a bad word don't say it ever i learned i learned the lesson <laughs> so you know when when the pastor was explaining sin to me i remembered this day that i said to my mom f you yes basically you know so i knew what sin was you know and because of that i knew that i was not perfect you know not only in my parents sight but in god's sight now there is something deeper that i want to go into regarding my con well yeah regarding my con conversion when the pastor was explaining sin to me you know so again you know started to attend church you know i was baptized i gave my testimony before the church the congregation and i was baptized and you know i started to learn the guitar and i joined the worship band and you know go to stunt church every sunday twice a day um, bible study on wednesdays you know social group on sunday evenings you know but after some time i walked away you know again life issues happened you know family troubles came up and i stopped attending church i walked away i was about 22 23 so i was you know i've been walking with the lord for a few years you know always believing you know like i did even when i was a little boy but now i knew the god now i knew the christ yes. you know the triune god so now my knowledge of god has shifted and i'm confessing christ you know in heart walking with him reading and studying my bible for about four or five years then i walk away back into the world nice. and i fall into great sin you know i go to the way of the world i never stop believing in the sacrificial atonement of christ that he died for my sins but what i didn't understand was i took it for granted yes. so i gave excuse to all the sin that i was committing again fornication you know drug taking you know fighting swearing things like that worldly things you know so using the grace of god as an excuse to sin 
Because in my head, Christ already died for my sins, so I'm free to do whatever I want. And this went on for um, at least over 20, over 20 years. Over 20 years yeah. living in the world, doing worldly things, you know, having two children out of wedlock, blessings from God that are still with me today. You know, I have a daughter of 13 and a son of nine. God Never bless. been married, you know. Yes. But, um, yeah. Um, going back to my sister's re um, time in her Jehovah's Witnesses, because one thing I used to love to do in London was talk to Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes. You know, so one day, you know, I'm on my computer and I'm searching on YouTube, you know, Jehovah's Witness testimonies and, you know, how to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, what is it they really believe? You know, just random Google, you know, YouTube searches. Yes. But slowly, on your YouTube feed, you get recommended videos. Now, yes. during this time, I've moved to Norway with my girlfriend at the time, mother of my two children. She's at work, I've got the day off, and my, my children are at nursery. So, you know, I'm scrolling down, and I see this video, and it's called Angry Youth Sermon. And I'm like, oh. This sounds good. It might have been clickbait. I don't know. We know of YouTube clickbait, you know, capital letters, exclamation mark to get your attention. But I click on it. You know, yes. not a fancy thumbnail, just a, a man pointing, you know, a preacher pointing. Anyway, I click on the video and the text of scripture that the minister was preaching from was Matthew 7 verses 13, 14, 15, and 16. And it, it was in these scriptures that convicted me. Bearing in mind, I was living in the world for over 20 years with the idea that I can do whatever I want because Christ has already paid for all my sins. Yes. So the text of scripture was Matthew 7, as I said, 13, 14. Yes. And we all know it. It's a good one. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Now, when I heard this text of scripture, I knew it was me. Because I didn't look anything like a Christian. I acted exactly like the world was acting. Yes. I was doing worldly things. You know, I was conforming and my love was for the world. And I sat in my chair in front of my PC and I thought, if I die tonight, I'm going to hell. I've had a, a personal battle, which sometimes, you know, comes up now and again in my walk with God. You know, am I doing enough? Because one of the first things that I started to do upon being convicted was living holy so to speak, like, like a Pharisee. Yes. And, you know, I would do this, you know, I would read the Bible, I would, I don't know how it started, but every time I tried to live normal, like a good Christian, and I sinned, you know, then the condemnation would come back, you know, then I would wait a few days and then I would go back to living Christian and then I would sin and then condemnation would come back. And this went on in my head for, you know, three or four or five months, six months even, until one day 
you know, I just knelt down before before God. This was during, the, I'm still living with my girlfriend at the time. Yes. But she's just gone to bed, you know. We don't, we're not sleeping together anymore. I'm sleeping on the sofa, you know. But then um, I kneeled down, you know, in front of the sofa and I said to God, look, I can't do this anymore. You know, I think I'm saved. I don't know. I'm trying to live the good life, but I keep sinning what's going on. And I said to him, honestly, I don't even know if I am saved. And if I'm not, you're going to have to save me because, you know, I can't do it. And I just gave up. You know, I gave up, you know, trying, trying to do, you know, trying to live the, live the life, you know, trying to be religious rather than a child of God. Um, again, this is like three or four years ago when I came back to the Lord. Um, I see it now. Um, there was a reason why. Was I born again when I was 18 or did I just become Christian? Was I born again when the Lord convicted me from his word or was God bringing me back to himself? You know, all I can say is um, to this day, I thank God for him. That Amen. whether I was saved when I was 18 or whether I was saved three years ago, I just thank God that I am, you know, that I know of him. That ultimately will be something that I will ask him when I get to heaven. Was I actually born again when I was 18 or was I born again? when you convicted me, you know, some things are just known to God. I just thank God for what he has done in my life. You know, you see, uh, I think my opinion, a small opinion that as long as you are alive, the devil will mm. keep tempting us, you know, and, uh, and mm. then we have, this is how we have, to fight it by praying to the Lord oh, yeah. by every time felt like we are tempted for something just praying to the oh, Lord yeah. saying his name and that will uh, save us of that and I think yeah. uh, you were born again uh, or not uh, I think you've been uh, saved by the Lord and uh, otherwise you stayed in the darkness uh, otherwise you wouldn't think that you came uh, to the to the you to be son of the Lord and uh, the Lord although we do mistakes but he always love repenters that we can we come back to him like uh, like you said yes. he's like a father and he is our father we he, like he, he never upset from us when we come back to him you know no, no. Yeah. you know and again speaking about you know temptations and the flesh the world the devil you know, um, the Christian life is a civil war. You know, first it's a civil war within ourselves because we fight the flesh, which is us, you know, against the spirit, fights against the flesh, you know. So yes. the Christian walk and the Christian life is first and foremost, you know, to, to fight against the temptations that we have in ourselves. You know, the old sins that we used to love, the old way of life rather than the new way of life, you know, in holiness and seeking to please God, you know, and understanding that, yes, at times in the flesh, we will fall into sin. But understanding, like from a mother, father or a parent child relationship, you know, like my like my earthly father, you know, I sinned, but he was still my father. And because he loved me, he disciplined me. You know, so my understanding of my relationship with my earthly father, you know, my relationship with our heavenly father absolutely makes sense. You know, Amen. my father had to distance me in the same way that, you know, all those years that I lived in sin and I took the grace of God 
as a license for sinful living. You know, Romans 6, did God save us that we may continue in sin? May it never be. But we have died to sin. And so when we do sin or fall into sin, we repent because God is our Father and He loves us. Amen. And His Spirit who which abides in us will not allow His children to act like devils yes. in the world. You know, um, it's something that, you know, um, we read about in Second Samuel when David sinned against the Lord with yeah. Bathsheba, you know, and the Lord disciplined him by Nathan and David repented, you know. To me, this gives great comfort because as the Bible says, it was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us, you know. Yes. And what an amazing gift that God has given us you know so i am eternally grateful because i am in no way you know the holiest man on earth you know there's lots of mistakes that you know i do in my walk with christ but you know um i ask god every day for grace and strength you know to give me a hunger for his word for prayer for fellowship you know and you know, I'm grateful for what he's done in my life. Amen. Amen. You know, we do sin and I repent. You know, this is the important thing. It's repentance and faith that please God. Yes. You know. And we'll keep fighting with the devil all yeah. our life. And this is what we call it oh, in, yeah. in uh, Christianity. This is, this is our understanding of something called jihad in translating in Arabic. <laughs> mm. or you know oh, yes. uh, oh, yes. it is it is a spiritually jihad with the devil uh, and Amen. it's not it's not like uh, fighting with anyone else it's but but the devil and ourself ourself and temptations and that's the whole idea the exactly the testimony of paul in romans 7 you know his battle yes you know where he says you know um the things I don't want to do, the things I don't want to do, I do. And the good that I want to do, I don't do. You know, yes. who will, you know, um, who will save me from this body of death? You know, but praise be to God. You know, so there is this inner struggle, this, this struggle, this jihad with the sins that we have in our flesh. You know, and now this Holy Spirit has come and, and sealed us and now the war begins because now now is God by his spirit and then there's the accuser of the brethren the enemy yes and he will fire darts of temptation and when we sin he's standing there accusing call yourself a child of God how can you be? You just sin. Look at you. You're filthy. How can God love you? You know, these kinds of, you know, deceiving tactics from him. Yes. You know, or Allah, <laughs> take your pick. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, the struggle, first and foremost, is, at least with me, is from within. You exactly. Know, I read the scriptures and I try to find out what it is that I'm doing wrong. Uh... You know. You you have to do, you have, like we cannot be exactly like like the Lord, but even if you remember after baptizing, he went uh, forty days and uh, fasting, and uh, the devil yeah. after that start tempting him, and uh, yeah. he he knew how to you know uh, send him away uh, empty handed, so he couldn't he couldn't he stepped on him as he stepped on Hades when he resurrected, so. Oh yeah. Uh, this is how we have to do, and we have to take him as uh, you know, uh, like him. We have to be like him, to act like him. He's he's our role yeah. role model, not the uh, earthly uh, people. 
So uh, no. he came no. to us to tell us how to do. Yes. Mm. You know, since coming back to the Lord, you know, there have been blessed periods and there have been unblessed periods. I wouldn't call them curses, but again, you know, during my time in the world, there wasn't an issue. I didn't struggle. Everything was free and easy and do what you want and just don't break the law, you'll go to prison, right? Yes. But when God calls his people, you know, and he saves his child, and again, speaking about this inner struggle of sin and the flesh and the Holy Spirit fighting within, you know, we want to do what's pleasing to God because we are born again by his spirit, you know, but then we still live in this flesh. And so there's this war. And so since coming back to God, you know, the struggle has gotten greater. Yes. As long as you, you know, as long as you go uh, greater in faith, as long as the struggle will go greater against you, you know that all saints became had that. All fathers of the church had that. Uh, as long as they grow greater in in faith and uh, and they pray and all, as long as the temp, uh, you know, the devil will come and tempt them more and more and try them more and more. But they always won by 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 the help of the Lord. And that's what's Amen. good about it. Amen. Uh, that's Amen. that's why know, I like I, to read their uh, about them. I like to uh, yeah. read about their experience. This is how we learn from them, from their experience. You know that sometimes yeah. uh, it's not about only about how we, we experience the, the, our thing daily by day, daily thing. We learn from them how to uh, how to uh, to pass this. Uh, these temptations by by their uh, you know what they help what they mm. tell us and uh, mm. it's really helpful wh wh when you read this this kind of things it is you know the scriptures are you know they are holy they are inspired you know words of god given by the prophets and the apostles you know yes their teachings from god himself and on one hand, I like to think deep, you know, so I can understand how other people might see the Bible as this mysterious book, this magical book. But when you, you know, read the testimony of the prophets and the apostles and the saints, you know, the scriptures are just, you know, God's dealing with ordinary men and women. You know, David was a sinner, you know, Adam, Abraham, they were Job, you know, they're all just, you know, it's books that we, we can relate to because it's a God dealing with normal human beings, you he, know. He came um, for the sake. Of course, of, course, of course they were saints, you know, Job and David and Abraham, they're saints and they're in heaven now. But yes. on earth, they were just like me, just like you. Yes. The thing that's great about these men was God, you know. And so when I read the scriptures, you know, it's God's interaction with everyday normal human beings and normal life, you know. Yes, there's the sense in which they are holy because they are inspired by God's spirit. But on the other hand, if we, at least for me, when I understand the scriptures, if I disconnect it, to how God worked in ordinary people on earth, Job, David, the apostles, the prophets, you know, it makes it more, you know, I'm just like Isaiah, you know, I am, a, you know, a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. You know, I can be like Peter where, you know, one day I will say, yes, Lord, I will die for you. And then two hours later, I'll be like, I don't know this Jesus. Who are you talking about? We can all be like that sometimes, Yes. you know, things like that. So to me, it's like, you know, I can read the scriptures and God can speak to me and teach me. But at the same time, it's not anything like, you know, um, 
I have to climb the ladder to heaven, you know, because ultimately we know that God took on the flesh of man and came down to us. You know, he can relate to us, you know, in all our weaknesses. Christ was tempted. That's what I said. He said, he said that yeah. I came for the sick, yeah. not for the re good people. That the, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the, the people who's not sick, they don't need a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there is the, um, the unfortunate, not saying every, every Christian, but, you know, there are some people perhaps, I don't know, but I'm assuming there are a lot of Christians out in the world, but there would be some that see the Bible as this mystical, you know, magical book that is unknowable. Uh, no. Those people, I think they don't even read it. Uh, they just uh, Christians no. by name. Yes, cultural Christians, you know, yeah, exactly, you yes. know. But, you know, to me, it's like, no, the scriptures are given for us to understand God. Exactly. God speaks to us in a language that we can know. And, and the scriptures are, you know, the stories of everyday men and women. And that's why you need, you, you know, know, that's why they fell down. Mm -hmm. They fell first. Those people who think stuff like that, yeah. they fell, they fell first yeah. in the, in the temptation or, or with somebody t tell them about, yeah, come, uh, we, we believe in the same God, the uh, Muslim and Christians, they have the same God. Or uh, yeah. we believe in Jesus uh, as Isa. They will fall down immediately. They will, because they don't know their scriptures. So yeah, uh, those people. Yes, we we saw so many of them, and uh, they are fake. Yes. They are fake already. Yes. Uh, you know, the majority of the world's religions will say you must reach up to God. Yes. You must be good enough. You must reach up to God, pass the exam, you get into heaven. The Bible teaches us, and the testimony of Christ and the apostles teaches us, God comes down to us. Yes. He's not yeah. the most exalted as in Islam, no. He's, uh, he came to no. us. Uh, you know, Islam, Judaism, you know, even though, you know, the Old Testament... I don't think it's true Judaism in the way that the rabbis teach it today. But the Old Testament, again, God is coming down. God is coming down. He came down to Abraham. Yes. You know, he came down to Moses. You know. Yes. He came down to the prophets. Absolutely. Other religions, Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, anything like that. It's always this sense of you have to do stuff. You have to work you know, to pass the exam and reach up to God. But you never reach. You you're, never reach. Because yeah, you'll be, you'll be the same slave as ever. But let me, I, something came to my mind uh, now. Yeah. Uh, while you were speaking, you spoke about sister being, uh, your sister being kicked out because she was Jehovah's Witness, yes? Now, uh, when you became a Christian, uh, any harassment or any somebody uh, told you anything uh, from your family or from the people you used to know from the mosques, uh, from uh, surroundings, from anything like that? Were you... Uh, anything happened? There was one instance. Um, remember my father passed away when I was 12 and yes. then my half-sister and her family moved in. So my brother and your now, as a teenager, I didn't have a social life. I went to school and that was it. I came home or I used to go to work with my brother-in-law. So, you know, I didn't have a normal teenage upbringing. I didn't do teenage things like go and play football with my friends in the park. I was always school or work, school or work. So socially, I didn't really have any friends as a normal teenager would. So with regard to um, what was said to me when I became Christian, now I explained to my brother-in-law, I was 18, so I knew the law was on my side, and I spoke to my sister, my half-sister and my mum, and I said, Natalie, my sister has invited me to this youth camp. You know, they were okay, they were fine with it, you know, they had no problem. 
but tell your brother-in-law. His name was Dave, David. Yes. So I told him, I went, I'm 18. You can't stop me. I'm going on a holiday with my sister to a youth camp in Devon. And his words, right, his words. Now, it's funny you mentioned what, you know, the question that you ask. His words yes. were to me, I bet you're going to become one of them, meaning Christian. And I said, what are you talking about? I'm only, I've been invited for a holiday and I'm going. Who said anything about becoming Christian? Yes. When I gave my life to Christ when I was 18, after the camp was over, um, the min- one of the ministers came to me and said, I would, you know, really encourage you, you know, bring your sister along for encouragement, but to let someone know, let your family know what you have done. So coming back to London, me and my sister go and visit my mother and, you know, I tell my brother-in-law, you know, I've become a Christian. Something that he said, I would become and something that I rejected. Yes. Of course I won't become a Christian. You know, it wasn't on my mind. I'm not going to a camp. I didn't even know what anything like that meant. But, um, you know, he called it and he got it right. So, you know, another part of um, our relationship that me and my brother-in-law, we used to have a good relationship until things went you know, sour. But um, another aspect to which, you know, he didn't like me even more because now I've become a Christian. You know, because he grew up as an orphan and he had a bad experience in an orphanage that was run by, you know, Catholics in Ireland. You know, again, you know, this is just a historical part of his upbringing. So he's always hated God, you know, so... When I tell him now, I'm Christian. It doesn't mean all Catholics are bad. It doesn't mean all uh, whoever oh, no, is bad. No, 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 it's, no. it's an incident like, happened to him. All religion, especially yeah. anything to do with Jesus Christ is bad. So, yeah, yeah, I'm not saying, you know, but in his head, anything to do with this man, Jesus Christ, or the church or Christianity, because of his experience, because of his yes. upbringing, you know, evil it is All hard sometimes we ta- yeah i understand you know, him sometimes uh, some yeah. some things we take them really hard and we turn it uh, we, yeah 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 so you know given his upbringing you know as an orphan it's understandable but as a christian you know i go through you know we all go through Tough oh, yes. times, you know. I'm oh, blessed yes. to be living in a country where I can practice my faith and not worry about having my head chopped off. Yes, you know. We read about the church being persecuted in the East, you know, under Islamic and Sharia law. Every day, you know, every day, and it's like, what a blessing! According to the, now, when I say blessing, I mean. You know, according to the scriptures, you know, blessed are you when people persecute you. You know, when you give your life as a witness for me, you are received in glory in heaven. Yes. You know, we in the West, you know, we take God and his word and the testimony of the Christian faith for granted. And... You know, the persecution that we think we have here compared to the martyrs of the faith, it's nothing. Yeah, you know, uh, when uh, uh, we were speaking about uh, St. Stephen earlier on, uh, that uh, he's the first martyr yeah. of Christianity, yeah. before when they were yeah. stoning him and before he died, he told, uh, he told mm. the Lord, forgive them, Lord. And... Uh, Amen. He, he didn't even uh, defend himself. He just, uh, the, the Lord t- took him. And uh, this, is, this was our first martyr in Christianity. And, uh, Amen. and this is how... He even says the word of Christ, you know, into your hands I, I 
give you my spirit. Amen, yes. Exactly the word of Christ, you know, forgive them, Lord. Forgive them, Lord. Yeah, he receives a vision of Christ and, and the Father. Well, yes. I'm not sure the Father, but he's Christ. And he says, hold this sin not against them, Lord. You know, they don't know what they're doing. Receive my spirit. Because they think they can kill uh, the body that says they killed us. They are going to finish us. Uh, they are, they are they killing can't. the body, not the spirit. We are going to our Lord. We, I will be very happy to meet my Lord. Uh, believe me. Uh, as soon as I, I think my Lord will know when is... Uh, my time, my, my, my time is ready in here, you know, because I have still some work to do on earth. And uh, when, when it's done, I'm ready to, to meet my Lord even tomorrow if he wants. But I am ready. Yeah. You know, there is a world out there that, you know, they do not know Christ of the gospel. You know, there is a there is a, a town, a house, a person who does not know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. You know, and you know, our commission, you know, to go and preach the gospel, you know, to yes. every creature, you know, to every nation. Yes. You know, the gospel of the good news that yes, we are all sinners. Yes. But Jesus Christ came. And if you are to put your faith and trust in him, you can be forgiven your sins and be born again and have mm -hmm. eternal life. You know, it's a simple message that a child can understand, but it's, at least for me, it's scary. You know, for me as, as a human, you know, there is an element of fear when it comes to mankind, you know. There is a sense where I fear man more than I, I fear God in the biblical sense, you know. But again, the more and more I get to understand, you know, the love and the message of the good news, you know, then the more I feel myself being built up in in faith, in strength, to proclaim this news to people, whoever will hear it, and whoever Amen. will, yeah. you know, understand the message and receive Christ as a savior. You know, of course, some people are gonna ignore it and dismiss it, but this is this is normal. You know, so for me, you know, I have to get over this fear of man because there is still an aspect of fear of man in me. You know yes but um you know this is me up until today you know in in my walk with christ and you know i will wake up tomorrow by god's mercy and you know ask him to refresh me in you by his grace and to grant me understanding in just you know reading his word and living the life you know be doers of the word not just hearers you know showing people christ in my walk amen. rather than just in my knowledge you know it's important for me amen yeah. yes mm. yes exactly yeah let now i have uh, a question as well came to my mind before we end it uh, because i think we, yeah. we we passed an hour and I don't know uh, uh, how long we should keep it, but this question, uh, because you spoke about your relation with the uh, mother of your two daughters or two, two son and daughter, I don't know. Two children, two, two, children. two, two, yeah. two children. Uh, daughter, son. And yeah. son, God yeah. bless them. Now, the question is, the, are you still together or you, uh, you got married or uh, you left each other or what's happened? Yeah, so we are no longer together. Um, okay. We keep a relationship for the sake of the children. Yes. Because it wasn't... So, yeah, so coming back to... Um, Norway. <laughs> the, Matthew, the Matthew text. Yes, you know, yes. Um, I said, like, you know, um, we were living together, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend, two children, same house. 
But then when God brought me back to himself, you know, yes. when I was convicted of my worldly living, then if you imagine a road and two people are walking along a road, but the road then splits, one goes to the left, one goes to the right. We get to the point where God has called me back to himself and the road is leading to the left. And my girlfriend is going to the right because she does not believe. So it's because of this instance that we broke up. Okay. She didn't Does accept... that make sense? Yes, she didn't accept the Lord and uh, that's why. She, she says she doesn't believe. So, yes. you know, I've said to her, you know, you can come with if you want. You know, yes. she was like, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm and like, you know, the breakup was amicable. You know, there was no, you yes, know, yes, yes, there was no understand. cheating. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we just decided to call it a day because I said exactly. to her, you know, God has called me onto a road that I, I can't leave. Amen. I won't leave. And marriage you outside know. outside the Christ is not a marriage. Uh, so yes, amen, amen to that. No, it's not. You know, and yeah. we never got married because, as I you understood. know, here in the West, you don't you don't need to be married. No, I meant you know? I meant if you want to continue no. on a marriage uh, thing in uh, in the West, uh, but it won't mm. be called marriage under Christ. Uh, and uh, you know uh, but so so it's better like that i think unless if she's uh, you know she accept the lord oh oh yeah exactly yeah you know oh definitely you know um you know th there's no way that i could enter into a marriage covenant with her outside of the faith you know yes. it's not wise no it's not wise because you know how can I serve the Lord yes. if my heart is even even in the scriptures Paul says you know even between believers you know I wish that you were like I am but if you must be married right so even even between believers you know Paul would wish you know that you know that we remain single so that we can give all our devotion and life to God. But if we marry, which is a noble thing, you know, it's a holy thing that, you know, is a gift from God to be married, you know, but then we are seeking after to satisfy our wife or our husband or, you know, but yeah, there is no way that, you know, if my ex said to me, shall we get back together and get married? I'd be like, can't do it. Yes. Can't do it at all. You need to be converted. You need to repent, you know, and believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's something that you can do, you know. I hope she will be saved one day uh, because uh, there is no, no yeah. saving but by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope she will be saved. Mm. What about your uh, children? You know, my, my daughter... Um, from a very young age, you know, I've been teaching her about Christ and the gospel and Christian living, you know. Yes. So she has her own Bible and she reads it when she can. Beautiful. You know, when she stays with her, her and her brother stay with um, their mum. Yes. But, they, you know, when they stay with me, you know, we read the Bible, you know, we pray before dinner, we pray before bed. You know, I teach them about you know, Jesus and the Christian faith and especially in today's world, you know, yes, young kids, school, society, but, you know, she loves Christmas, she loves Easter, you know, she cries over Easter because Jesus died on the cross. And I said, but why are you sad? It's, it's good news. She went, but he died because I'm a sinner. I went, amen, yes. he did. We cry with him you because know. he died, and we we, we yeah. feel happy with him because he rise. Yeah. Amen. 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 I mean, of course he died. Yeah. You know, because we are sinners, and this is how God shows us that He loves us. Amen. 
but we can be happy when he rises again. So, you know, she understands, you know, the basic, you know, gospel concept of death, burial and resurrection, you know, so, you know, my son, you know, he's like me, he's like the superhero God. (laughs) <laughs> he's like god is like incredible hulk if god wanted to he could lift up the whole world with his little finger and i said you know what gabriel if god wanted to and god does he doesn't even need a little finger to lift up the world he can just say to the world be lifted and it is and he was like wow god doesn't even need a finger i'm like that's how strong god is you know Amen. so yeah. He's again into the whole superhero God, you know, so anytime you watch a superhero movie, I'm like, you know what, this guy is like a weakling compared to God, you know, like Spider-Man or Superman or, yeah, you know, and he's like, wow, you know, so, yes, a child of, you know, a child of small faith is, is a blessing, yes. you know. Yes, that's so, good. I thank that's God for them. Thanks, Lord, for them and for you. Uh, you thank came you. to the Lord, yes. and uh, that's blessing. That's a blessing for us. Um, would you like to say something, anything uh, else before we end it? Um, sure. Yeah. What I would like to say is, you know, um, testimonies are important. You know, for for the brothers and sisters in faith. Um, We've all got our different testimonies from where we grew up, how we came to the Lord, how he saved us. You know, we can be encouraged by how the Lord has worked in our lives. But for me, my testimony is not the gospel, you know. my testimony is is mine you know god's going to work differently in his in his children according to them you know i like i said before the beginning i didn't have a paul conversion i didn't have a john conversion i didn't have a peter or an amir you know i had a me conversion because god came down to me and reached me and convicted me amen he will do whatever he needs to do depending on who he needs to reach Amen. so i hope that you know my experience and my testimony can give encouragement to to others i'm again open for further questions if anybody wants to post something or you know when people want to hear this or whatever but um yeah you know do not take my testimony as the standard you know, it's not the gospel. It's just how God reached me with the gospel. So yeah. that's what I would say. Yeah, you know. it's that great. We should always be humble, and uh, we know understand. We understand. We are not uh, anyway. We are all u- unique by ourselves. You know, like uh, yeah. we don't have to be like any anybody else, like a saint, like or like Saint Paul or anyone. Uh, we have to be ourselves. Mm. Our Lord came to us as we are. You know, Amen. so this Amen. is how we are. This is how our Lord came to us, and this is how He wants us. Otherwise, uh, we'll be like each other, and that's uh, not not the great thing ever. <laughs> you know, so no. yeah, no. this I think uh, he, he will love you as you are. He will love me as I am, and he will love everybody as he is individually, and that's how he loved us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, yes. thank you very much, brother. For my, my pleasure, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will thank you very much for you. It was a blessing having you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, God bless you and uh, keep you safe. If anybody has uh, need help to be to to learn more about Jesus, if struggling with, between Islam and Christianity or anything just please come forward and we try our best to help 
and even not just Islam, any anything else, uh, but just come forward and we'll help you uh, with the help of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, uh, we'll be just uh, his servant will help you as much as we can. Thank you, everybody. And bye bye. Thank you, brother. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. God bless. God bless you. God bless you.